This is the Vega Pod, inviting you to look at the issues through a biblical perspective. Let's go ahead and drop the intro. What's going on, everybody? Today, we're going to be looking at the Christian origins of the Enneagram. We're going to look into that and dive in and to see how this claim kind of gets thrown out there and whether or not there's any truth or validity to the claim. So so heads up, this video is going to be a little longer than some of the other ones. I have a few slides to run through and keep an eye out. I do plan on doing a part two with a good friend of mine. We're going to be looking at whether uh, or not, the Enneagram is good for Christians. Um, after this video, you'll kind of see which way I lean. Uh, but let's go ahead and dive right in. Christian origins of the Enneagram. All right. So the book on the screen, we're going to be uh, looking into that right now. Um, the symbol there, if you're not familiar with the Enneagram, it's a personality test. Um, that's becoming just more popular as um, you go to different churches and just amongst Christians and other people as well. Um, but being that I'm a follower of Jesus Christ, my main concern is whether or not Christians should be using this as a tool and whether or not there's any truth to this idea that the Enneagram has Christian origins. Was it really started by a desert father? That's the question. And was that desert father a Christian? That's another thing we can look at. But let me go ahead and uh, switch my view here. Actually, what I'm going to do is I'll be here in the corner. Um, I think I should look okay. So let's go ahead and dive right through it. Cool. All right. In 1995, so this is a quote from the book here on the right, um, The Enneagram, A Christian Perspective by Richard Rohr and Andreas, or Andreas Ebert. In 1995, I, Andreas Ebert, stumbled on a text by the old Christian desert father, Evagrius Ponticus, that, what's that say there? None plus to me, sorry. Even though I didn't understand all of it, I immediately had the sense that this text must have something to do with the Enneagram. Might this be the first and only written source pointing to the emergence of the Enneagram symbol? In January 1996, I published my discovery. The article was titled, Are the Origins of the Enneagram Christian After All? And number 11 of the Enneagram Monthly, an international journal. In April and May of 1996, the same journal, carried a long essay by Lynn Carollo, Pythagoras, Gurdjieff, and the Enneagram. We're going to be looking at some of the claims by Gurdjieff in the uh, part two um, of this Enneagram topic we're going to tackle, so keep an eye out for that. Uh, where are we at here? Who had made the same discovery, and independently of me at the same time. Lynn Carolla is a graduate of J.G. Bennett's International Academy for Continuous Education in Sherbourne, England. I am grateful to her article for some additional information, especially the decoding of the Pythagorean number symbolism. The text that we had come across apparently contains essentially clearer hints about the origins of the Enneagram than all the earlier legends and speculations. So are the origins of the Enneagram Christian and not Sufi? After all, the Jesuit Robert Ox, one of the first Enneagram disciples of Claudio Naranjo was convinced that the Enneagram was profoundly rooted in Christian mysticism. Now that's that's a big deal. Notice that here in his in this book, this is the book that they're writing about the Enneagram, a Christian perspective. He acknowledges that it's based in Christian mysticism. Notice that that's not something that's brought up often. All right, let's go ahead and keep going. Ox recognized the tradition of the Desert Fathers, a group of fourth century monks who had developed the view of the seven deadly passions that charged the types with their energy. In 1992, the German Benedictine Anselm Grun had also noted some astonishing parallels between the Enneagram and the teaching of the passions developed by Evagrius. So again, we see this name, Evagrius, Evagrius Ponticus, the Desert Father. This is where this idea comes from. So we're going to be looking at 
who is this Evagrius Ponticus? So like I said earlier, the Enneagram has recently become very popular amongst churches. We are going to be examining whether or not the Enneagram has Christian origins. All right. Who is Evagrius Ponticus? All right. Great question. Evagrius Ponticus, born 346 in Ebora. Pontus died 399 in the Cilia and Natrian desert in Egypt. He's a Christian mystic and writer whose development of a theology of contemplative prayer and asceticism laid the groundwork for a tradition of spiritual life in both Eastern and Western churches. If you're not familiar with this idea of asceticism, it's more um, these monks that like, they denied their bodies, like um, more or less everything and anything. You know, they they made a big deal about fasting and not eating, um, elevated to a level where they shouldn't have. But again, notice how at the introduction here, you know, and you can look this up in the Britannica Encyclopedia.com. Evagrius Ponticus is referred to as a Christian mystic. That's important. We can't just overlook that. You can't just gloss over that because you want to make a claim and you want to make this claim seem more valid or, or stronger. Evagrius was a noted preacher and theological consultant in Constantinople when a personal spiritual crisis prompted him to leave for Jerusalem to become a monk. He, son withdrew, he soon withdrew into the Egyptian desert where he spent the rest of his life evolving his mystical theology in theory and practice while he supported himself by copying manuscripts. Now, as you dig into this a little bit, you'll see why he left um, Constantinople and went to Jerusalem. Um, he He's a, what's the word here? He has some very, um, I guess, good morals in some senses. The reason he left was he was, he found himself being caught up with a woman who was already married and he didn't want to, you know, break God's law in that sense. So he said, hey, you know what? It's better for me to leave. Now, as you, as we look at, uh, more of his life story, you'll see that it's a little more complicated than that, but it's giving you a bit, a brief background of why he ends up leaving. All right, next slide here. Continuing, Evergus Ponticus, a monastic theologian, was one of the most talented intellects of the fourth century, circulating in elite ecclesiastical circles of Cappadocia and Asia Minor. He began his career under Basile of Caesarea and Gregory of Nascentius, serving with the later, with the latter in Constantinople through a stormy tenure that culminated in the Second Ecumenical, Ecumenical Council in 381. Known then as a brilliant heresiologist, Evagrius seemed destined for a successful ecclesiastical career. He chose a different course and fled to Jerusalem, where he took vows in the monastic communities of Rufinus and Melania. From there, he traveled to Egypt and lived in monasteries in Atria and Kelia. In Egypt, he wrote extensively in a variety of genres, letters, proverbs, brief sayings, chapters, and treatises, nearly all geared toward explaining and analyzing vice and virtue, demons and angels, psychological and psychosomatic phenomena, and some, the life of the ascetic. His accounts are set, sometimes explicitly, oftentimes pensively, within a well-developed metaphysical system that responded to both classical philosophy, that's in Plato, Aristotle, Stoicism, and the theology of some of the most accomplished Christian intellectuals, Clement of Alexandria, Origen, Gregory of the Sciences. All right. So, so back on Averius Ponticus. Next slide here. We're going to be looking at a letter uh, from Jerome. If you're not familiar with Jerome, Jerome was also a, um, I guess, a church father. And he is responsible, if I'm not mistaken, for the translation of the Latin Vulgate. Um, so here we go. Even in his own day, Evagrius' views have been criticized. A controversy over how to conceptualize God that broke out in the Natrian Desert in, in 400 saw a dispute in which one side was influenced by originist views, although Evagrius was not mentioned in this dispute. In 415, Jerome's letter, 133, accuses Evagrius of being a prominent originist and critiques his teaching on apathia. Now, we'll define what apathia, I think, in this in the, the next slide. Ultimately, it's something that goes against Orthodox Christianity. It doesn't fit in. Um, and let's go ahead and look at his letter here. So this is what Jerome had to say. These heretics have affinities with Gnosticism, which may be traced to the impious teaching of Basilides. So this idea of apathy ultimately has its origins in Gnosticism. Um, Gnosticism is something that um, theologians and biblical scholars believe that the letters of, of John, particularly 1 John, is responding to this idea of Gnostics, right? 
they are he is refuting these teachings of of Jesus not um, having a body. So these uh, ideas or teachings that Evagrius is promoting has its origins as Gnosticism. Let's go ahead and continue reading here. It is from him that you derive the assertion that without knowledge of the law, it is impossible to avoid sin. But why do I speak of Priscillian, who has been condemned by the whole world and put to death by the secular sword? Evagrius of Ibera and Pontus, who sends letters to virgins and monks, and among others to, to her, whose name bears witness to the blackness of her perfidy, has published a book of maxims on apathy, or as we should say, a passivity or a perturbability, a state in which the mind ceases to be agitated and to speak simply, simply becomes either a stone or a god. His work is widely read in the East, in Greek, and in the West, in a Latin translation made by the, his disciple, Rufinus. He has also written a book which professes to be about monks and includes in it many not monks, at all whom he declares to have been originists, and who have certainly been condemned by the bishops. I mean, Ammonius, Eusebius, Euthemius, Evagrius himself, Horus, Isidorus, and many others whom it will be tedious to enumerate. Now, why does it matter that Jerome calls Evagrius a heretic, right? Why does that matter? Well, Jerome was someone as a prominent uh, figure, and it's not just him that says it. As we continue reading, we see that he's Actually, I said it in the last slide as well, but a council condemned his teachings, right? It's not just one guy. It's a group of uh, believers who are having this conversation. Hey, listen, these teachings are contrary to what the word of God has to say. The word of God is our standard. Everything has to be measured up against that. Let's go ahead and look at another one of these uh, guys here. This is Cyril of Scythopolis, Life of Sabbaths. Now, if I'm not mistaken here, this slide um, is from the Evagrius uh, Pontus site. It's um, the link is in the video description. I think it's uh, the guide to his life or something like that. Um, but so this slide and the other slide that had actually I'll flip back so you guys can see it. And this slide um, both come from that site. Anyway, so here we go. Agapetus, Agapetus, on becoming superior of the new Laura, found four monks in the community. Admitted, admitted there by the simple-minded Paul out of ignorance about them, who whispered in secret the doctrines of origin. Their leader was a Palestinian called Nanus, who, pretending to be a Christian, assimilating piety, held the doctrines of the godless Greeks, Jews, and Manichees, that is, the myths concerning pre-existence related by Origen, Evagrius, and Didymus. Fearing lest the corruption of heresy should be spread to others, the blessed Agapetus, with the agreement of the sainted archbishop, Elias, and at his bidding, expelled them from the new Laura on being expelled. They went off to the plain to sow their pernicious weeds there. So this guy, Agapetus, is um, confronting these teachings. Um, this is in the 6th century, right? So this time, Evagrius is long dead. Um, so he's confronting these teachings that ultimately stem from Evagrius, and he's saying, hey, this is a heresy. And why is it a heresy? It's a heresy because it, it's, what does it say here? It says the myths concerning pre-existence. All right. Next uh, bullet point here. When the fifth holy ecumenical council had assembled at Constantinople, a common and universal anathema was directed against Origen and Theodore of Mofpuestia and against the teaching of Ebagrius and Didymus on the pre-existing pre-existence and a universal restoration in the presence of the approval of the four patriarchs. So they held this idea of the pre-existence of the soul. And this idea of universal restoration, more or less universal salvation. That's contrary to what the Bible teaches. All right. So let's next slide here. Quick recap. Who is Evagrius Ponticus? Evagrius Ponticus started off as a solid teacher who was zealous for the scriptures and avid defender against heresies. He fell into some mystic teachings and later became a monk. He was denounced as a heretic by Jerome. And Jerome was, was saying this around the same time. They were more or less contemporaries and condemned as a heretic in the council in 553. All right. So let me jump back here. So if this idea that the Enneagram was indeed started by Evagrius Ponticus, this idea does not have Christian origins because Evagrius Ponticus was not a Christian. He might have started off that way, but as we see later throughout his life, he falls into mysticism, and he is denounced as a heretic by his contemporaries and later on by a council, right? So that's important. So if 
Let me say it again. If Evagoras Ponticus really did start the Enneagram, right? It's all based on his teachings and his ideas. It is still not Christian because he was not a Christian. All right. Next slide. Pythagorean. All right. Moving farther back in time to Evagoras Ponticus, a fourth century desert monk, Ponticus, is another off claim originator of the Enneagram, for he used the Pythagorean number theory to describe his Enneagram symbol. And at the next slide, we'll look at what Ponticus wrote. Now, this is from the site Theology Think Tank. This guy went through and he kind of um, refuted this idea of Iberius Ponticus being the originator of the Enneagram kind of point by point. So I would encourage you to go in there and look through it. So um, a bit of a lengthier article. It's not too long. If you're interested, definitely look through it. We're going to look at what Ponticus wrote here, particularly about Pythagorean. All right. I've divided this discourse on prayer into 153 texts. And this way, I send you an evangelical feast so that you may delight in a symbolical number that combines a triangular with a hexagonal, hexagonal figure. The triangle indicates spiritual knowledge of the Trinity. The hexagon indicates the order creation of the world in six days. The number 100 is square, with the number 53 is triangular and spherical. For 28 is triangular and 25 is spherical, five times being 25. And this way, you have a square figure to express the fourfold nature of the virtues and a spherical number, 25, which by form represents the cyclic movement of time and so indicates true knowledge of this present age. For week follows week and month follows month and time revolves from year to year and season follows season as we see from the movement of the sun and moon of spring and summer and so on. The triangle can signify knowledge of the Holy Trinity or you can regard the total sum 153 as triangular and so signifying respectively the practice of the virtues and contemplation of the divine in nature and theology or spiritual knowledge of God, faith, hope, and love or gold, silver, and precious stones. So much then for this number. And this idea of a triangle signifying knowledge of the Holy Trinity, we do use a triangle to um, illustrate the Trinity. I don't think that this is the same idea. So I'll throw that out there. Um, so I'm going to the next slide and, and see. So again, this is a quote from Evagrius Pontus, right? This is kind of this idea of the Pythagorean, what he's describing here, a modern math whiz, um, but it's based on the Pythagorean or Pythagoras. Um, I think it's the, the theory or the theorem. So let's jump into the next slide. Pythagoras believed all his number that the universe had and had and obeyed some sort of inner order which by the study of numbers the human mind can comprehend however imperfectly this divine structure as previously stated and we're sitting here for clarity if ponticus system is said to be the origin of the enneagram but was based on the pythagorean number theory there is a huge problem the enneagram relies on the zero the decimal and the repeating decimal place values but both the zero and the decimal point where, where an unknown at this point in history and mathematics. Let me read that again. If Ponticus system is said to be the origin of the Enneagram, but was based on the Pythagorean number theory, there is a huge problem. If the Enneagram relies on zero, the decimal and the repeating decimal place values, but both the zero and the decimal point where, where an unknown at this point in history and mathematics. So Ponticus and none before him can be the originator of the Enneagram. At this point, because either Ponticus nor any before him can be the originator of the Enneagram, there is no need to go back farther to find a specific origin for the numbering system. All right. Moving on and continuing this idea of Pythagorean. Uh, this is actually a quote um, from Ronald V. Mullins. This is actually, I pulled this from Marcia Montenegro. She is a uh, ex New Ager who was uh, an avid, um, you know, I guess user of the Enneagram. Uh, she is a, or was, I'm sorry. I guess she still could be, but whatever. Um, a professional uh, astrologist. She is a follower of Jesus Christ. She has a website 
I think it's called Christian Answers for the New Age. So I pulled this from her uh, Facebook ministry page. And I also have a link in the video description uh, pointing to her page as well. So I have several times noted that the claim that Danny Grant goes back to Evagrius of Pontus and the Desert Fathers and Mothers is sheer fantasy. This is based on Richard Rohrs and Andreas Ebert's misinterpretation of a single passage in Evagrius in which the two authors imagined that Evagrius was trying to describe an actual diagram. In reality, he was only speaking in a way that was very common at the time about the shape of numbers. Rohr and Ebert imagined that this diagram consisted of a combination of the number shapes Evagrius spoke about to create the attached diagram. You will note that even if they had been correct in assuming Evagrius was thinking of a diagram, which he never claims it to be, that's important. And Evagrius quote, he never claims it to be a diagram. Danagram would have he would have had in mind those nine points derived from overlapping hexagon and a triangle look nothing like the anagram symbol as we have it today. Let me repeat that. The anagram he would have had in mind those nine points derived from overlapping a hexagon and a triangle looked nothing like the anagram symbol as we have it today. Next slide. All right. In reality, Evagrius was simply drawing out what he saw as the allegorical significance of the number shapes themselves to illustrate. For example, 4, 9, and 16 are square numbers. 4, 9, and 16. Right? Square numbers. Uh, where are we at here? 3, 6, and 10 are triangular numbers, and so on. 3, 6, 10. Got it. This is a real no-brainer for anyone with the larger context of the patristic writer's commentary on biblical numbers where we find it quite often. All right. But apparently, Rohr and Ebert were not sufficiently familiar with the patristic writer's practices to understand what was going on in the Evagrius passage. This is a result of promiscuously fishing about in the patristic texts for some support, any support they might find for the Enneagram symbol along with its attendant personality test. The predictable result was that they anachronistically read both their symbol and the test back into the single passage in Evagrius, and the whole Enneagram community uncritically took over their idea. Ronald V. Huggins, you know, is it? University of Toronto, Toronto School of Theology. Dude is well-educated, right? He says some dude just making stuff up. All right. I'm going to repeat this because I think it's important. This is a result of promiscuously fishing about in the patristic text. It's not in there. They're writing, they're reading it into it, right? As Christians, one of the things that we do when we read the Bible, or we shouldn't be doing anyway, we don't want to read our own presuppositions or ideas into the text. We want to let the text speak for itself. That applies to anything that we're reading, right? These guys here, when they looked at this, you know, passage in Evagrius' writings, they read this into the text. This idea that the Enneagram symbol was in here, they read that into the text. That's not what he's talking about. All right. Million dollar question. Does the Enneagram have Christian origins? No. All right. So. I am going to attempt. Um, you know what? Let me take that back. We're going to give it Evagrius Pontus, um, the benefit of the doubt. We're going to say that, hey, this dude, um, he really is the originator of the Enneagram. And, uh, you know, um, he, uh, he was a Christian, right? So we're going to look at some of his, um, one of his writings, the writings that they claim as to be, I guess the basis of this idea of the Enneagram, right? Um, and this is uh, in the video description. Um, this is the research gate link. Um, this is Eight Spirits of Evil by Bagrius of Pontus. And this is a translation. Obviously, it was, um, I can't remember what language it was written in, but so here we go. So there's eight of them. We're not going to look at all eight. I want to say before we jump to all of them, um, some of them did seem to have good biblical foundation others 
while he quotes verses, when you farther examine it, it falls short. And that's what I'm going to show here. But again, we're going to go into this. We're going to give him the benefit of the doubt. So let's see what we got. All right. Gluttony. This is what he has to say, the first two bullet points here. He who is able to keep his appetite in check reduces his passions, but the one overcome by the wish for food suffers from enhanced desire. Desire for food breeds disobedience, and a refined taste will block entrance into paradise. What? Yeah, I don't know. The palate is delighted by an abundance of food, but that same abundance feeds that immortal worm of punishment. An empty stomach is good preparation for prayer, but a full one brings on a very heavy sleep. Now, let's look at what the passage here has to say. Then the disciples of John came to him saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. Now, this is just one example. But all through Jesus' ministry, um, most of, a lot of the accusations that were raised against him was for this reason, right? Hey, everybody else is fasting. Why are you not fasting? Why are you and your disciples keep eating? Jesus said, hey, I'm the bridegroom. Don't fast when I'm gone. But let's back up a bit, right? Because he says, this offer food breeds disobedience and a refined taste will block entrance into paradise. So, and it says, ascetic lifestyle, eating, was not a good thing. Right. Eventually, that's kind of why he dies. Um, but Jesus ate a lot. He he was eating. He was enjoying his time and it didn't affect his prayer life. Right. Um, the disciples, you know, they were hanging out with him. They were eating. They didn't affect them. So this is where you see this kind of over generalization, which isn't helpful. Right. I think that there's, you know. We should fast, but that's not, it's not a commandment, right? Now, he titles this section gluttony. So he's responding um, or he's pointing out how gluttony is a sin. But as you read it, you see some things there that are, hey, listen, this, this isn't, this isn't what is being said in the text. Let's jump into the next slide here. Fornication. Hey, I agree. Fornication. It's not good. Don't do it. The face of a woman is a virulent arrow that strikes at the heart and deposits its poison there. And the longer it stays there and the more putrid it becomes. He who is wary of these weapons will avoid large gatherings and will not wander around festivities gaping. It is better to stay at home and devote oneself to prayer than to consider attending festive gatherings. If you wish to be chaste, avoid talking to women and do not trust them at any time to venture into your presence. Let's do this. I have nice things to say about women. Okay. He doesn't. That's very contrary to, to how Jesus lived and what Jesus taught. Um, and this is actually somewhat of the nicer section of what he had to say. If you read this section, it's not good. He doesn't say a lot of good things. So let's look at what the Word of God has to say. This is the Apostle Paul writing to the Corinthians. Now concerning the matters about which you wrote, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman, but because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. Now, he's telling us not to get married. Avoid women. That's not what the Word of God has to say. Paul tells us that if we're burning with passion, go ahead and get married. He says, we're burning with passion, run away. Avoid women, right? They're going to, uh, you know, they're going to trick you. Don't trust them. That's contrary to what God has to say. Let's look at the next slide. Anger, okay? All right, I can see how anger is uh could be a sin or lead or lead to sinful actions. Excuse me, but let's see what we have here. Anger is the passion of madness that makes intelligent people mindless. It makes people savage and avoid company. A strong wind does not move a tower. A fury without anger will not carry you off the soul. Water is moved by forceful winds, and the enraged person is disturbed by unreasonable thoughts. Okay, what does the word of God has to say? We're going to look at John 2, um, verses 15 through 16. And this is the story of Jesus being in the temple, right? And making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, 
take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. Now, Jesus was angry here, okay? Was Jesus being mindless? Uh, was he being savage? Uh, was he avoiding company? Um, what else here? It was he disturbed by unreasonable thoughts? No. This is where you see how this is an overgeneralization. And, and this actually can create more problems than it helps. So we have to be careful with these things. Now, so, so far, Evagris, sorry, dude. These things that you're teaching, not really based on the word of God. Let's look at this next verse. This is the Apostle Paul here, Ephesians 4, 26 to 27. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Okay. Be angry and do not sin. Are we going to listen to uh, the Apostle Paul or Evagrius? Right? He's telling you, hey, being angry, don't do it. It's not good. Paul says, be angry and do not sin. Those two things can't coexist, right? This is, again, where we have these oversimplifications, and they're not helpful. And I think this is the uh, last slide. All right. Depression. The monk suffering from depression does not know spiritual ease any more than one in the throes of fever knows the taste of honey. He is unable to move his mind to contemplation and never offers a pure prayer. Depression is an impediment to all good things. Hey, if you're depressed, I'm sorry. According to Evagoras, you can't offer a pure prayer and you, your depression is an impediment to all good things. You're stuck there. Get rid of your own depression. Like, seriously? How is this helpful? It's not helpful to anybody. Let's see what the Word of God has to say. Psalm 34, 18. The Lord is near to the brokenhearted and saves the crushed in spirit. You know, like I said, right? He's attempting to use biblical texts as he comes up with these ideas. But one has to wonder, what text were you looking at? Because some of these is like, come on, man. All right. Matthew 5, 3 through 4. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Now, in his defense, the guy, he, he, used, he puts this in the article that he wrote. Uh, he uses depression, but the word um, that Evagoras uses is grief and sorrow. But the idea is, is still there, right? So if you were to substitute the, the word um, for depression, grief, or sorrow, it, to be honest, I think it makes it worse. The Lord is needed a broken heart and have saved the crushed in spirit. That, you know, that, that can't align with what Evagoras is saying. The blessed are the poor in spirit, for this is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. That's somebody that's grieving, someone that's you know feeling sorrowful, right? And going through a tough time. So, all that to say, Evagrius Ponticus, his claim, uh, this claim by Richard Brewer and Andreas Ebert and others who promote the Enneagram, that the Enneagram has Christian origins, that is false. Do not be deceived by that. That claim is not true. Evagrius Ponticus, while he might have started off as a, you know, a Christian, you know, he was Salas, right? He was defending against heresies. He ultimately fell into these mystic teachings and was later denounced as a heretic. Okay. So even if the Enneagram, which it does not, right? These people have done plenty of research into this and it's just not, it's just not in the text. It's not there. But even if it was, Evagrius Ponticus was not. A Christian, not an Orthodox Christian, right? Um, so that claim should not be accepted. The person who makes that claim needs to come up with evidence, and it's just not there. Um, and if they say Evagrius, you know, did right? Let's say you no know, years go by, and we do a little more research, and we find out, hey, Evagrius, you know what? When he uh, when he wrote this stuff down. He, he maybe did have the Enneagram in mind. Okay. He still wasn't a Christian. And this is, this is the most important thing here. If you look, you look, as you look at his writings, you know, the, um, the eight evil spirits, we looked at four of them. They don't align with, with the Bible, uh, what the Bible has to say, right? The word of God is the standard. And 
you know, going back to the same thing, and I, I hate to have to repeat myself this often, but I want to make sure that it's clear. Evagoras was a Christian mystic who was denounced as a heretic by his contemporaries, Jerome in particular, and others, and later denounced with his teachings um, as heretics in the Council of Constantinople in 553. So I appreciate you guys tuning in. Keep an eye out. Like I mentioned earlier, a friend of mine and I are looking to do a part two on why the Enneagram is not good for Christians. And we'll look, uh, we'll examine a, a few other uh, points. Um, if you like the video, hit the like button, share the link, uh, subscribe. If you're not already, follow me on Instagram at the underscore Vegapod. And I'll catch you guys next time. Have a blessed week. Hey, enjoy the rest of your Sunday. And thanks again. Check me out. The Vegapod.